Thank you so much, Cynthia, and thank you all for coming. We have a, a terrific day ahead of us here, and I want to start by uh, introducing our very first speaker this morning, who's going to participate in our community engaged research panel. We're um, going to do this in a forum of actually having the presentations first and then having a moderated session later, during which everyone can ask their questions. So it's my great honor to introduce Cinci Hernandez Cancio, which I hope I pronounced correctly. Uh, born in Puerto Rico and coming via NYU uh, and uh, with her uh, uh, JD from NYU Law. Uh, she has been a leader at the national level for advocacy for women and families and access to health for all. Her experience spans government, spans labor, non-for-profit, and she's the vice president for health justice at the National Partnership for Women and Families. And we're so fortunate to have you here to present to us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was working, right? Yes. So my name is Cincy Hernandez Cancio. That was close enough. Um, <laughs> and I am. <laughs> And I'm very excited to be here today. Um, I come here not just as this expert of all the things that um, Dr. O'Hara just said, um, but I also come here as someone who is the daughter of a promotora, the daughter of a primary care physician who also uh, was a professor of medicine in Puerto Rico, um, and as someone who, despite a lot of privilege, barely made it out of childbirth alive. And so I think it's really important for when we are in spaces like this, for us to take like academia into what real life experience looks like. So I want to talk to you today a little bit. This is weird. Like I can't see. I know I'm only five feet tall, but if I go down there, you'll see me, right? OK. <laughs> So I want to talk to you today a little bit about racism, healthcare, and motherhood. It's a story in two acts that I want to tell you today. First act, oh my god, I don't know what happened to that. That is act one, it's supposed to say act one. I am not in jail. <laughs> but this is four-year-old Cincy. And when I was four years old, Sorry, I, this is not going the way I thought it would. When I was four years old, my father had matched to do his residency in a small city in Western Massachusetts. And he had been working in the hospital, doing his rounds, and he came home one day extremely angry. And this probably works better if I take this off since six feet at least, I'm sure here. Um, and he came home screaming and yelling. And I was a very impertinent, uh, precocious four-year-old who loved to hear what grown-ups were talking about. Sometimes I would even hide under like the kitchen table so they wouldn't realize. And the story he said, the reason he was so angry, was that he had noticed, he had been rotating the ER, and he had noticed that all of the Puerto Rican patients only got to see students. And he had the audacity as a newly minted Boricua doctor to ask his attending why this was the case. And this attending looked my father in the eyes and told him, bueno, not bueno, he wouldn't speak Spanish, that's me. You know, those are the ones we practice on. A year later, I'm really ill. They thought I had meningitis. I'm in that ER. They separate me from my father for reasons I don't understand now, looking back, because he had privileges there. And I'm by myself on a cold metal bed with a bunch of white people with masks on, not unlike that one, except not red, um, holding me down. And I'm screaming and scared and yelling. And I think, people, when they have masks on, they're going to operate. And I'm supposed to be asleep. But I guess they're just practicing on me. And then we move fast forward to May 2006. And none of this animation is working, but that's OK. Um, you can imagine it. And 
after having a really tough pregnancy with, I had a perfect team. I had the maternal fetal medicine people ahead of me, like set up, I had all sorts of specialists. I, got fi I had gotten fired from my OB because I had the audacity to ask them to coordinate with my neurologist for my migraines. They thought it was too much to ask and I got fired via email by my doctor. Um, and here I had clearly preeclampsia symptoms. I'm told by my doctor, go to the ER. The ER, go to the, to the hospital. The hospital sends me back after three hours. Come back the day later. I end up having to have a failed induction, a emergency C-section, and then they send me home four days after that, even though the day before I'd had a fever. And I'm trying to add the whole time, you know, I'm an educated person in healthcare, and I was fighting for it. It's like, don't send me home. I'm not ready. There's something wrong. No. They don't, they always know more than you. And then three hours later, I'm back in the ER. I'm septic. It was a horror story kind of experience where my incision ripped open and was pouring blood and puss out like a horror story. I ended up having to have two surgeries after that. Here I am in the ER with my four-day-old, not knowing if I'm going to live or die. When I got finally after two surgeries, 16 days in the hospital, I was told I was colonized by four different bacteria. And that's how I was sent home. When I went to the aftercare to ask what happened, I went to my, my, my OB. His answer was, must have been that dirt that I sprinkled in your wound. And this is in one of the top hospitals in the DC area. And so the thing is that, luckily, we're all good. That's him now. And I really, literally, almost died giving birth to him. And it was treated as inconsequential. And I was treated as inconsequential. And that, and that is a person with an advanced degree, English, perfect English, in healthcare, and still, still, I was not able to get the system to serve me in a way that would at least preserve my health. So that's why I think it's really important that when we are talking about the work, the incredible work that you are all doing as doctor scientists and community advocates, to always center the experience of the people who are going through these structural issues. Because at the end of the day, I don't know if all they saw was Hernandez Cancio with the accents in my record and that that made them less interested in hearing what I had to say or less confident in understanding that people are actually the experts of their own bodies. And so that's why one of the reasons that I am so committed to working on these issues. So one of the things that we, do, we did um, now at the National Partnership, I've been there for two and a half years, with the help of a PCORI grant, um, we were able to create a tool to how do we disrupt this regular operating procedure of, that leaves us, leaves so many of us um, marginalized, not listened to, and risking death and disability on a daily basis. And so we decided that we needed to figure out, create a tool um, to disrupt, disrupt those standard processes, um, targeting specifically what researchers, decision makers in policy and practice, and advocates could be doing to rethink the way, you know, to stop the usual process, which clearly was not designed to help people like me and people across, and, and women in general, because as you all know, our, out, 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 our outcomes and I have long COVID, so sometimes I have word issues, so bear with me. Um, and so what we wanted to do was figure out what were the questions and recommendations to help dismantle that system of structural racism um, by surfacing here are like decision points, key decision points in this cycle um, where we can stop, ask the right question, and then make a better choice um, to advance health equity. And so what we came up with was what, when we started really looking into where are the points where we, have, where we can disrupt the process and ask better questions to make better decisions, that it was actually a virtuous cycle. Like initially we were focused on research because it's PCORI, but then we realized that when you start, you know, that 
that when you do this the right way, it continues to spiral upwards to better a better process, right? So you have to start with, you know, when you define the research question, that's one important point, designing the research study, on and on, and then you use and share your results, then that feeds the development of public policy. And as we implement that and evaluate that, then that shows up. What are the other questions that need to be asked? Like one of my experiences a long time ago, my, my kid had RSV, and so I was on the American Academy of Pediatrics thing for the committee for um, RSV you know, practice guidelines, and I was the only parent in that room. And none of the questions that they were looking at mattered to me as a mom. They were like, well, this medication might reduce three hours in the ER. I'm like, I want to know if it means my baby can finally sleep. And then the response is, well, that's an excellent question. But we haven't studied that, so we can't say anything about it, right? So that is what we need to change. We need to change, and engaging in the community is how we find out what are the outcomes that people, human beings, not clinicians, not people who are basically focused on, no, no, no offense, publishing, um, how can we make better decisions? And so what we create, and it was funded through PIC, Picori. So what we created, and I just want to show, kind of highlight a little bit on the research side. We have the same thing on the, on the um, advocate side. So for example, when you define the question, there's some specific que questions you should be asking yourself when you're defining the research question, right? Are you actually focused on something that has a disparate impact? Are the people and communities that you are, that have the disparate impact, helping you identify what are the right research questions, and on and on. So I don't want to take a lot of time on this, but I do encourage all of you, we have this on the website, um, on our website at National Partnership, but there are ways to ask the right questions so that when you're designing the study, you are really integrating equity and community needs and priorities. When you're generating the evidence, and again, I don't know what happened there, um, is are you, basic things, are you actually collect, collecting race and ethnicity data? and and subgroups, right? Because as a Boricua, as a Puerto Rican, um, the fact that Puerto Ricans have much worse outcomes um, than, than the rest of Hispanics gets kind of averaged out when you're looking at the data. When Puerto Rican women, for example, have outcomes much more similar to black women in this country, right? Um, so we need to make sure that we are subdivided, and in the API community, ni se diga, right? It's like it's such a, there's so many differences in experience and outcomes. Um, and then when you're analyzing the evidence, you want to make sure that you are not just including diverse uh, subjects, but that you're actually analyzing those results in that way. So for example, in a lot of PCORI research, we, what we found, because we were assessing uh, several different programs, uh, several different projects, that some of the researchers actually had the race and the data, but they weren't looking at the results um, through that lens. So, What's the point, right? Like, we, the, we were not able to, to extract the information that would have been really, really useful for addressing some of these racial and ethnic health inequities. So with that, I just want to say again, remember to center the experience of people in their communities, right? Um, there is so much that we need to do better, and so much that with the right attention and the right resources, we can do better, because we know where some of these failures happen. So again, thank you very much for inviting me to share my story. Remember the power of combining story with data. That is what changes minds. That is what changes policies. That's what changes uh, the structures that are keeping many of us behind. And it's not that hard to do um, when you ask the right questions and rethink how you're doing your work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was uh, extremely powerful. I now would like to introduce Dr. Perez Stable, who is the director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. He has practiced um, primary care in the early stages of his career, 37 years here at our neighbor at UCSF. And his research interests are really centered on improving the health of individuals from racial and ethnic minority communities. I'll hand over to you, Dr. Perez-Dave. Thank you. Is this going through okay? Yeah, okay. 
So I will follow your example and stay down here. I think uh, I want to first of all thank the organizers for this meeting. Uh, I was a general internist. Uh, what am I doing talking about maternal health or child health? But uh, I think it, uh, as an NMHD director, I have to pay attention to all populations, all ages, and all conditions related to disparities. Um, we started a little bit of discussion last night. So I, I'll start with the NIH uh, definitions of what we call health disparities, uh, and this is what our institute uh, goes by. First of all, this, the first three bullets listed on this slide are in our legislation. So they were authorized in the year 2000 when we were created as a center by congressional uh, action. So all racial and ethnic populations, minority populations, as defined by the census, so that could change uh, in 2030. It almost did in 2020. Um, all poor people of any color, and, and we sort of create that definition, less privileged socioeconomic status is the, 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 uh, the words we use in, in that definition. And underserved rural residents, that was also part of our original legislation uh, population we haven't, uh, I think, paid as much attention to across NIH. And then in 2016, after uh, a process that was really started by Dr. Tabak when he was principal deputy, all sexual and gender minorities are included for NIH research purposes. And uh, that was not a, a straightforward process, uh, if, if you care to hear at some point. And the unifying factor here is, first of all, these are all identity or conditional issues. They're not, or they're not uh, medical conditions. They're not chronic conditions. You can look at 50 chronic conditions that all have major disparities, uh, and, and depending on which one you pick. Um, but they're all unified by this social disadvantage, as we call it, uh, that results in part from being subject to discrimination or racism and being underserved in healthcare. So those are two unifying factors for all these populations. So a health outcome that is worse, usually in comparison to a reference group, which is most often the majority population, whites uh, or people who are better off uh, or you know, college educated, um, uh, is what we define as a health disparity and certainly something that uh, we, we would consider reevaluating re in the coming years. One of our mantras at NIH, and this is NIMHD's mantra, is that race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status are so important uh, health determinants that influence health outcomes that we have to measure them. And we have to measure them in a standardized way and consider them. Not saying that they're causal. They're not necessarily causal, but they're factors to think about in all human-related research and service and clinical care. Uh, I think that that's now mostly accepted at uh, NIH, but in the, let's say, the, although behavioral, social, and population scientists have been doing this for years, a lot of clinical researchers do not. And I would say that there's still clinical trials that are published without including uh, these, uh, this kind of information in, in, uh, in the results. Uh, it predicts so much, I, I use the example of severe maternal morbidity and mortality, that we don't fully understand. It is not entirely related to uh, the things that people might think it be. And all minority uh, women actually have worse severe uh, morbidity rates compared to whites. Mortality is higher for African Americans and American Indians, Alaska Natives only compares in comparison to whites. Asthma disproportionately affects African American and Puerto Ricans. And even as a point made earlier about Latino Hispanic populations, Puerto Ricans have the highest morbidity mortality rate uh, from asthma in the country. Mexican Americans have the lowest, yet we're both Latino and uh, Hispanic populations. So it's important to look at subpopulations when possible, but do not let that uh, defeat the purpose of categories because then you get into tiny sizes and you can't say much statistically. Um, most chronic diseases are more common in people who are poor, and it's not because of bad behavior. There are a lot of structural factors that go into that. And then even within a diagnosis of diabetes uh, and data from Northern California Kaiser, all racial ethnic minority groups there, and they had a good representation across the board, had twice as much end-stage renal disease and 30 percent less heart failure, heart attacks, and heart disease. So what is that about? Same disease. Similar care, because it's Kaiser, so it's a fairly good access and standardized access to medicines uh, and, and reasonably good outcomes, yet very different outcomes that we all care about. 
heart attacks or, or dialysis. Uh, and uh, that, I think, is, uh, remains an unknown to, as far as I know. So what can science do to reduce these in inequities? I, and do the basic things well, uh, again, mentioned earlier, you know, um, so measuring race ethnicity is not rocket science. It's really pretty straightforward. We should just agree to do it a certain way and forget about your favorite terminology and just have everyone do it the same way. It's really hard to get scientists to do that, much less systems. Uh, and what we don't do hardly at all is to measure social class. And I think other than the proxy of insurance, that systems rec uh, collect for obvious reasons. There, could, there are many ways that we could do that much better in clinical care and in clinical research. Uh, I think we need to do a lot more with big data. I think that uh, we don't need to do a clinical trial for everything. And the more we standardize collection of data and be able to merge data, not just electronic health record, but population data with linking with existing data, I think the better we'll be doing that. We need to be an engine for diversity of the workforce. We are at a crisis. 14% um, of graduated physicians today are from unrepresented uh, minority groups, uh, which excludes Asian Americans. Um, uh, most Asian Americans are not underrepresented. Um, and 14% of new PhDs given in the United States in any STEM field, so broadly defined STEM, so including all the behavioral scientists, uh, are in underrepresented groups. Pipeline's not empty. People aren't getting hired. Um, and uh, it's not full either. And what's the population proportion of the underrepresented groups, which is African Americans, Latinos, Pacific Islanders, and Native Hawaiians, American Indians, Alaska Natives. We don't know yet what to do with multi more than one race. Um, it's about 33% of the US, 30, 33%. Uh, so there's a big gap. And we're not going to make that up in the next few years. So we have to get the, the fire in our belly to, to make a difference there. This conference is about community engagement, and I'll come back to that. But we clearly need to emphasize that. And then we need to implement what we know. Because if we only did that, we would make things better. Uh, we would decrease health inequities. Um, we acknowledge there's lots of social determinants, particularly around the structural determinants. I list some of them here. I show this slide to highlight the, the Phoenix Toolkit collection that we have been working on uh, building. We created a social determinants of health uh, site. Uh, it actually was uh, launched in May of 2020 uh, after going through a process to say these measures we're vetting as NIMHD. Uh, actually, it's an NIH-wide committee, but we were leading it. Uh, the individual measures are there. We're about just about finished with a phase two to vet additional measures. We do it with an expert committee of external scientists that we uh, invite, uh, and uh, they work for about a year, year plus usually, in reviewing the data and then uh, having a report. Uh, and I heard a briefing about the, the latest phase a, a couple weeks ago. So I'm very pleased with this. I think this, we're going to direct more and more of our applicants to say not only uh, hey, look at this and use these measures, but we're, gonna, we're, we're building towards requirement uh, of certain set, a minimum set of measures. And in our space at NIMHD, it'll be in the social determinants of health. Now, and I, and mental health has already done this uh, for their grantees, for some of their uh, measures that they want everyone to collect and requiring them. NIMHD generated, the staff generated this uh, research framework based on work that um, we had done at uh, NIA when I was on the council there. And this is just to capture the complexity um, and the challenge of our science. Uh, because minority health, health disparities uh, has a science behind it. It's blending everything from biology and behavior to the built environment to social cultural environment. And then the healthcare system for that 20 to 30 percent of people with chronic diseases that do depend on the healthcare system to sustain their health and improve their health. Uh, and in the different levels of influence, we still, I, I don't think there's a, is there a, a point around here? No. Uh, we still fund the majority of our grants in the individual column, mind you. We, 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 this is not our, uh, this does not accurately reflect where we distribute all the money. So as we look at this every year in our portfolio analysis, we want to shift more of that funding to the right 
uh, particularly in the community and societal, societal and policy level research. Um, and uh, we depend on you, the extramural community, to send us applications that uh, score well. So turning to community engagement, I think we're, we're at a, a threshold of a major change at NIH, and I wouldn't be standing here talking about that uh, or doing it alone. Uh, so the, the, the uh, pandemic brought about, uh, triggered the formation of the Community Engaged Alliance Against COVID-19 Disparities. Uh, this was a product of a process related to the Moderna trial uh, where inclusive participation was critical. Of course, we couldn't stand this up in time to influence the Moderna trial because that had to happen very quickly. But the idea that Gary Gibbons and I had with this was let's set up something and let's see what we can do because, of course, the vaccine's not going to be the end of it. Uh, if it would, had failed, of course, we would have had to deal with a bunch of other issues. The, the success of Ford meant that we had to deal with other issues. And, and by the way, today, death rates for... Latinos, African Americans, and whites are not different uh, from COVID-19 in this stage of the pandemic. Let's see what happens this winter. So you can see the 21 teams that we have stood up. This is just reflective of where the pandemic was acting at the time and where we had, uh, as we say sometimes at NIH, assets, where we had uh, centers already funded, individuals that we knew. And it was literally, we don't know where the money's coming from. We don't know what you're going to really have to do here, but we need you to step up and, and apply for some, some we have, we're, we're going to generate money for this. Right now we're spending maybe uh, somewhere around uh, 40 to $50 million in a, in a fiscal year on SEAL. Uh, it is run out of NHLBI because they have the staffing and, the, the, and, the, and just the ability to, to put this up, but it is, co-led by NMHD and NHLBI. I'm very involved in it, and my staff are very involved in it, and we actually also provide a substantial amount of funding, disproportionate to our differences in, in total budgets, I'll say that. And Gary has become a, a terrific partner for us. It started with the idea that, you know, this is a partnership, and everything about SEAL is a partnership. Uh, the grants are going, or the, the awards are going to academic centers, but they're listing, they're, they're working with partners. Our structure of, of advice, the steering committee and different committees that have been set up, the research committee and the and, uh, are all partners with the community organizing leaders and academicians who are not involved on the 21 team. So, and, and we're going through a second phase of it. The idea of building trusting relationships, acknowledging the role of social determining, listening to what they have to say, Sometimes not, I think, the optimal direction. <laughs> For example, SEAL focused a lot on, you know, and this, this, this group will like that, children uh, and, and, and COVID uh, in the last uh, year. And I thought, well, really, children, yes, we're important. We can't forget children, but, you know, the people who die are the older adults. So let's not forget those. And, but uh, it, it's, all, it's all good uh, at this point. Uh, and really, you know, when, we, when people started working on this, they thought, well, let's get Oprah to do a PSA or, or, or a famous athlete. Or, and, and, and in fact, you know, we had done research on this 40 years ago here in the Bay Area uh, in the smoking uh, world. And, and we found out that, you know, the, the people didn't want to listen, didn't want to hear about famous people. They want to hear about their doctor or nurse, uh, their local trusted uh, a leader uh, as a po or, or expert as opposed to uh, famous people about health issues. Um, and so eventually they, they, uh, that, that, that message got through to Moderna. So racism was discussed earlier. This has been sort of the, so community engagement as a platform is what we want to see happen. So we want to see SEAL become a model that continues. This is not COVID dependent. It's not a one-off. It's not appropriations from Congress. Uh, we're kind of scrambling over how we're going to fund it. But we say this is a research platform that needs to continue from NIH perspective. And we need to do more than COVID if we have the sufficient support. Can't do everything, but we'll see how far we can take that. And, and I think this is the time for that to actually happen. Racism is the other big lesson from the pandemic. You know, the murder of George Floyd brought about a bunch of 
activities and change, I think that has clearly waned uh, on a national level. I think I sense that from institutions and from just the general uh, knowledge. This is a survey from the Kaiser Family Foundation. I, I think they're working on an update, but I haven't uh, seen it. Um, asking about the last 30 days, have you experienced uh, being treated unfairly because of your race or ethnic background? And notice that for African Americans, it was 53%, and for Latinos, it was 36%. So we have a problem. <laughs> in our society when this is a snapshot in 2015. So imagine what it would be now as people are much more aware and conscious of these issues and are willing to talk about it. This is not polite conversation. And in fact, within government, I would say that the African-American staff were probably loath to even bring this up until, uh, until this whole issue became more, more, uh, uh, more front and center in 2020 because they were worried that they would be then pigeonholed into, oh, you're a complainer, you're talking about racism. And, and I'm not a racist, of course not, look at what I've done. And there, people get very individually defensive about this. So uh, we, of course, are about research. So we say, well, how, what's racism as a research construct? How can we look, look at it? Interpersonal, which is what that um, survey reflects. Uh, is, is the most work done. Um, many uh, scientists have developed good scales, uh, David Williams, Nancy Krieger, and others. Um, these are on the Phoenix uh, website. But we really wanted to focus on structural racism. There are other categories to think about that have not been studied as much. And structural racism as a construct was hard to get your head around, uh, in part because you know, it's not so easy to measure. You had to do population measures, and we're still not sure, can we even change it? What can we do to it, uh, with it? And that's a challenge for you as an extramural community. It's relevant to maternal health and to uh, children's health. Um, this is an example of uh, structural racism. I'm sure you've all seen maps like this. This is the District of Columbia, so Washington, D.C. Um, and in the 30s, um, there was a, um, a policy of redlining uh, done under the, you know, the progressive administration of uh, Franklin uh, of FDR, uh, where banks would not lend to the type H, you know, Negro developments, lowest grade parts of the district. And this was repeated in every large city in the United States, essentially. And the mark segregation that you see today that persists uh, was a direct product of this policy, particularly accelerated after World War II. And for all the Negro developments, the Puerto Rican, Latino, Mexican American, all the same thing followed in the 50s as that population increased. Uh, and so the, I, I, the analogy I, I'm using, uh, I learned from a, a training I went through is, imagine you're playing Monopoly. Everybody's played Monopoly, right? More or less, or your kids. Um, and that you, you put a, a, some, a, some of the players over here, you know, you can't start until an hour after the game starts. You, you start an hour after. Uh, and an hour after, you start. But of course, the other players have already, you know, purchased properties and put some houses on and hotels. And you start off paying rent every, every time you stop. Well, that's what this did to African Americans and to Latinos in this country. Uh, and then how are we going to blame the individual uh, for what's going on. And I think that I'm trying to get your understanding of these structural factors causing adversity. Um, yes, people may smoke more or do this or do that, uh, but it's not just about behavior. There are structural factors that we need to see how we can, we can affect. And this has been um, uh, an awareness that is relatively new at the NIH level, for example. Uh, and even in my case, I would say over the last several years, sort of consolidating the thinking about this in, in a way that was not there, I'd say, 10 years ago. So um, many examples of community-driven health equity structural interventions that have been looked at uh, here and there, and I won't dwell on this because I want to let you know about COMPASS, the Community Partnership to Advance Science for Society. So um, uh, uh, Francis asked for the common fund to do something about structural factors, structural racism. And this is the product of that. Um, the co-chairs and lots of staff worked on this over a period of time. Uh, I joined that group in uh, about a, a little over a year ago. 
uh, with Shannon Zank from nursing and Josh Gordon uh, from uh, mental health and uh, the Tribal Health Research Office and Women's Health Research Office at NIH. Uh, and, and we have developed uh, two, or staff, I should say, really developed two funding opportunity announcements that are listed here. They're open now, uh, get people to apply. Uh, the most important one is the OTA, which is other transfer. Uh, it is uh, a funding that's going to go to community organizations. So we're turning things around. So rather than fund academics and have them get partners and create a coalition, we're going to fund community organizations, and then the community organizations are going to ask you, as uh, academics and researchers, to come in and join them on this. That's what our expectation is. We know that many of them don't have uh, the administrative uh, uh, capacity to run these big projects, but you know, we're going to help them with that. Uh, we know that many of them don't have the research skills. That's where I think your, your role is going to come in. And then we have a coordinating center that's also been out, and we're going to have other uh, research, research hubs, but those, uh, that RFA is not out yet. Uh, I am told that I'm short on time, so I'll run through these data quickly. This is work from Elizabeth Howell, um, uh, work in uh, New York City. So, uh, and the point here was that in the low black-serving hospitals in New York City, the severe maternal morbidity rates for black women uh, was lower than for white women in the high black serving hospitals. Uh, so just think of that for a minute. So there's, there's not the, it's not the woman's, what she brings to the table. That's not the whole story uh, to this. Uh, it's the structure of the hospital or the doctors or the, or the staff in, in each of the hospitals that are leading this. This is a clinical trial in earlier this year to treat uh, hypertension during pregnancy, uh, that if we did that, we would decrease morbidity. Of course, African American women are much more likely to have hypertension during pre chronic hypertension uh, during pregnancy. And this is evidence-based, randomized trial. Do implement, do what we know, and that will help reduce morbidity. Um, this is a study of, that we fund in Southern California looking at air pollution and the relationship to depression. Uh, postpartum depression, uh, which is a major problem in, in, in women after birth, as you all know, uh, and some association there. This is a still, of course, in the, in the exploratory causal pathway. This is work from one of our uh, early stage investigators, uh, Dr. Rodriguez in Oregon. Uh, we're looking at coverage, uh, um, emergency Medicaid expansion, prenatal ex care expansion, uh, if you compare, in this case, Oregon to South Carolina, control of gestational diabetes with uh, anti-diabetic medications would be better. You know that if you get, you're pregnant, you get emergency Medicaid, that's, a, uh, that's true across the country. It ends in six weeks, right? Because after six weeks, you're done. Um, and yet, uh, a third of maternal deaths occur uh, after six weeks of, uh, of delivery. So I think this is an extension. This is going to help particularly the uninsured uh, women who are not going to be eligible for Medicaid because of documentation status uh, is one factor, but they also be because they're working uh, and they don't quite meet the Medicaid eligibility in, in their state. Um, uh, this is in terms of asthma care and looking, this is through the OCHIN network in, uh, in the Northwest, looking at community health centers where use of both in, um, emergency department for asthma in children versus uh, using the clinic. So I'll finish uh, with some general thoughts. Um, you know, we need this equal partnership with community organizations, scientists, and other sectors, uh, service sectors. So, for example, if you're dealing with chronic mental health issues, not only the researchers in the community organizations, but SAMHSA, which provides funding for service. And you can see HRSA having a role in other, or housing in many cases. Building trust takes long-term relations. This has not come easy. And this takes time, and, and we as scientists need to, and clinicians need to invest that time in building that relationship. It doesn't like you just don't show up or send your research coordinator. That's not the, they want to see the scientists. Our communities want to see people. Uh, and that's, I think, uh, you know, it takes time to invest in that. And, and we have to find the right balance there. Recognizing the importance of health and engaging communities and enhancing the role of staff. So these are our connections. So thank you for your attention. And 
guess you're next. Thank you so much, I mean, Dr. Uh, Perez Table. That was inspiring. And we were greatly honored here at Stanford to be a participant in the SEAL initiative as part of California's efforts. Um, Dr. Nicola Cook could not be with us today, but she has recorded her talk, so we're going to see that now. She's the Executive Director of Patient Center Outcome Research Institute. And uh, you, uh, I'm just going to hand over to her recording. Good morning. While I wish circumstances would have allowed me to join you in person today, I am so pleased to be with you virtually. I applaud the organizers of this summit for their continuing leadership in research related to maternal and child health and innovating approaches that bring communities as partners in this work. For PCORI, maternal morbidity and mortality is a critical element in our research agenda. In our 2019 reauthorizing law, Congress specifically called out maternal mortality as a priority research topic. And we've long recognized the need to address the low ranking in the United States amongst high income nations in various measures of maternal health, as well as the significant disparities in maternal outcomes that are experienced by certain populations, particularly black, American Indian and Alaska native, Hispanic and rural populations as well as those with low socioeconomic status. I'll be sharing with you today some examples of PCORI-funded studies addressing maternal health, as well as some general themes and lessons learned around our work on engagement of patients, communities, and other stakeholders. Community-engaged research is very much in PCORI's wheelhouse. It's baked into our mission which is to help people inform, make informed healthcare decisions and improve healthcare delivery and outcomes by producing and promoting high integrity evidence-based information that key to this comes from research that's guided by patients, caregivers, and the broader healthcare community. Producing such evidence requires engaging with communities. We seek to answer real world questions about what works best for patients given their particular circumstances. And we focus on outcomes that patients and other stakeholders identify as being most important to them. This slide captures engagement as we conceive of it at PCORI. We define engagement as the science and art of robustly bringing together and meaningfully involving patients, caregivers, purchasers, payers, clinicians, and even communities and many other stakeholders throughout the research process. All the way from planning the study and design of the research question, to conducting the study and participation in the research, to review of the funding applications, and dissemination and implementation of study results. Patients and other stakeholders are represented on PCORI's five advisory panels, which provide guidance to PCORI staff and leaders on funding priorities and other strategies. We believe that including the voices and lived experiences of patients and others helps to ensure that we're studying the issues and outcomes that matter the most to them. At the bottom of this slide, you can see the six key principles that we've determined are essential to effective engagement. And these include reciprocal relationships, when roles and decision-making authority are defined collaboratively and clearly stated. Co-learning regarding the research process and patient-centeredness. Partnership in valuing all members of a multi-research stakeholder team and transparency, honesty, and trust, which are enhanced when decisions are made inclusively and the information is shared readily with all research partners. When done well, engagement benefits everyone involved in the research enterprise. For patients and other stakeholders, it can help them develop a deeper knowledge and enthusiasm for research, improve their own health and ability to access healthcare, and give them the feeling that they're making a difference. For communities, engagement with health research can help to build community trust in healthcare researchers and institutions, build research capacity in the community, and strengthen relationships among stakeholders. And for researchers, it can enhance their knowledge and of engagement best practices and build a commitment to future engagement, 
but most importantly, it inculcates a deeper understanding of the real-world experiences and concerns of the study populations. One of the most important lessons we've learned about engagement is that one size just does not fit all. Flexibility is key. Circumstances can vary from one study to another, depending on the population, the community's history with research and healthcare, and even the outcomes being studied. One final way in which we seek to build capacity for engagement is through the appropriate training of all parties. A common challenge that's been shared with us by investigators and other stakeholders is the need for readily available trainings to facilitate bringing together teams of individuals who have varied perspectives and interests. And so we've developed two key resources for this purpose, both available on our website. The first is building effective multi-stakeholder research teams. It's an online resource that's designed to help research teams work together as a productive team and to help all members of the research team be active participants. We've also developed an online research fundamentals course to help anyone who would like to learn about research and the research process about how to be involved in patient-centered stakeholder research. We finally offer funding through our engagement awards to support building new skills related to engagement for investigators, patients, and stakeholders. That was just a brief summary of some of the lessons that PCORI has learned about engagement over the past 10 years or so, but now I'd like to focus on how we're thinking about patient and community-engaged maternal health research, which, as I mentioned, is a priority research topic area for PCORI. To guide our work in this area, we've developed this comprehensive framework, which captures our thinking about the whole context of maternal health and potentially identifies some key areas of research, including preconception risk factors, diseases, conditions, and events that can cause death or harm through the stages of pregnancy, delivery, and postpartum, and the social determinants of health that can contribute significantly to risk across the reproductive lifespan. It's striking to see that about 60% of maternal deaths are preventable, and this is representing a true call to action on the part of all of us. We've already released several funding announcements focused on engaging approaches to advancing maternal health, including topics such as improving postpartum maternal outcomes for populations that are experiencing disparities, access to and quality of care, aspirin to prevent preeclampsia, and optimizing prevention and treatment of postpartum hemorrhage. One new funding announcement that we will be releasing shortly and that I particularly wanted to mention is the Partnering Research and Community Organizations for Novel Health Equity Research, or the Partner Initiative, which has some innovative features that will help generate research that addresses maternal health outcomes, as well as enhances the capacity of community-based organizations to conduct comparative clinical effectiveness research. This initiative focuses on multi-component, multi-level interventions that will simultaneously address health conditions and the social determinants of health. And we'll be looking to leverage existing partnerships between research organizations and community organizations, especially those that provide social services or address specific social needs of affected individuals or households. This funding also requires that community organizations be full partners with the research organizations from the application all the way through the conduct and dissemination of the research. Awardees will also be required to develop a research mentorship program focusing on investigators underrepresented in research, as well as the development of a learning network. These are the kinds of innovations and funding that I think will help increase the capacity to conduct community-engaged research. A number of our funded projects in the area of maternal morbidity and mortality have been engagement projects, which we fund with the specific intent to bring together patients, caregivers, clinicians, and other stakeholders into research. These are not research projects, but rather they're projects that are designed to enhance the capacity for communities to engage in comparative clinical effectiveness research. And we've funded nearly 40 engagement projects related to maternal health on topics such as building capacity to advance indigenous maternal health equity in the Southern Plains, 
and partnering with community doulas to improve maternal and infant health equity in California. We believe that bringing more and more diverse perspectives and voices into the research process from topic selection through design and conduct of research to dissemination of results will influence research to be more patient and community-centered, useful, and trustworthy, and ultimately lead to greater use of research results by patients and the broader stakeholder community, and therefore help to address health inequities. To help identify the highest priority areas for research, we've also done a great deal of direct engagement with the maternal health community. And all of this help and input will help inform decisions on future funding related to maternal health. Some of the most important issues that we have identified include addressing health equity to advance maternal health outcomes for vulnerable populations leveraging community-based and patient-centered models of care delivery, the importance of addressing racism, sexism, and socioeconomic status, mental health, the impact of policies about midwifery, and telehealth. And some of the most significant barriers that were identified through these engagement efforts relate to creating safe spaces to help stakeholders lead conversations on questions and outcomes that focus on their needs and experiences, and the need for mechanisms to provide support to patients, stakeholders, and researchers to help them understand funding opportunities and training to help them better understand comparative clinical effectiveness research. So with all of this input, we've recently completed a rapid review on telehealth strategies related to maternal health. We funded evidence reviews that are underway by um, funded by PCORI, but underway with AHRQ on postpartum care and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And we've launched the Small Organizations Capacity Building Award. And this new funding project will support projects that help small groups build the skills to become partners in patient-centered outcomes research. And they'll undertake activities like educating patients and other stakeholders on the basics of patient-centered outcomes research building long-lasting stakeholder networks, and asking stakeholders to help create future ideas for outcomes research and creating new logic models and governance models and tools that will advance this work. To wrap up, I'd actually like to circle back to engagement for a moment and its power really as a tool for advancing maternal health equity. Engagement is inherently oriented toward advancing health equity as it means seeking out and hearing the voices of those that the research is really intended to benefit. And this slide provides a few of the important reminders of things to remember that will help us to hear these voices, especially those of historically underserved or excluded populations. When done well, engagement can advance equity through facilitating recruitment, building trust, and leveraging the expertise of community brokers or those who already engender the trust of the community. I'd like to finish today with a quote from Blanche Thomas, a patient navigator in a study comparing three ways to manage diabetes in an African-American population. And Blanche said, you have to meet people where they are. This study was recently featured in a video and story on our website that really captured the essential input of community members in any research study. One of the arms of the study included text messaging support, encouraging healthy diabetes lifestyle choices. And Blanche and others in her community helped the research team to tailor those messages for the people in their community. You have to meet people where they are. It's a common refrain at PCORI. It's the essence of engagement, really. The idea that for research to be truly meaningful, for those that it's intended to benefit, engagement is not merely a good idea. It's essential. So how can we do more to truly meet people where they are? Thank you so much for the opportunity to join you today.